proudly we hail. From New York City, where the American stage begins, here is another program with a cast of outstanding players. Public service time has been made available by this station for your Army and your Air Force to bring you this story. As proudly we hail Winfield Scott, great American soldier and patriot. Our story is entitled, The General Builds an Army, a great story of the early days of our great nation and of one of the brave men commemorated by the pages of history. Our first act curtain will rise in just a moment, but first, young man, why not let a thought for tomorrow be your thought for today? Right now, your United States Army, the senior service, needs qualified technicians in such varied and interesting fields as radio radar, meteorology, photography, and many, many others. Yes, you can be trained to do a job and acquire a skill that will be of great benefit to you for the rest of your life. You can also take pride in the fact that you answered your country's call in time of great need. Why not let a thought for tomorrow be your thought for today? Visit your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station and enlist in the United States Army. Remember, let a thought for tomorrow be your thought for today. And now your Army and your Air Force present the proudly we hail production, The General Bills an Army. The life of Winfield Scott reads like a highly colored adventure story, and in many respects, that's just what it was. For in a military sense alone, he managed in one way or another to become noticeably involved in most every conflict, major or minor, that our country was faced with from 1808 to the war between the states. From Lance Corporal Scott, who seized a British warship's boat crew in retaliation for similar and more flagrant actions by the British Navy, to Lieutenant General Scott, commander of the Union armies, this Herculean man on horseback rode through the pages of American history. To try and portray his entire career in this short space would be unfair to both you and to him. And so from the book of his life, we have chosen one exciting chapter which we hope in some way will clearly picture the man and soldier, Winfield Scott. Washington, D.C., December 1813. President Madison is conferring with his Secretary of War, John Armstrong. Mr. President? Uh, yes, John? I, uh, I have the map. Uh, good. Let's have a look at it. <clears throat> it uh, covers the entire area. Buffalo to Montreal. Yeah, so I see. This Wilkinson here? What's left of his command? Uh, Queenston, Stony Creek, Burlington Heights, and now Chrysler's Field. Mm. Uh, it's a wonder we lose so many battles and still keep men under arms. It's not the men, Mr. President. I know. Well, what about Scott? Any news of him? Hard to tell when he'll arrive. Weather like this. Not going to be a very merry Christmas this year, John. Uh, no. Perhaps, Mr. Madison, I should resign. Oh, nonsense. There's nothing wrong with the plan of your campaign, merely the execution of it. If Hampton and Wilkinson had... 
Well, what's the use in talking about it? From Scott, we'll get a clear enough picture. He's young, full of fire, and from all indications, he has the ability to lead and to succeed. <laughs> You must be weary from your ride, sir. Not overly, Mr. President, thank you. I believe you've already met Secretary Armstrong. Yes, sir, I've had the pleasure. Well, then if you feel up to it, I suggest we sit down and get to business. Now, first, Colonel Scott, I, I want your own appraisal of what happened at Chrysler's Field. I want to know why the Northern Campaign fell apart and why we find ourselves in such a vulnerable and desperate state. It's common knowledge that the British, a few more regiments in Canada, they'd be across our borders and on the way to Albany with little to stop them. Well, I'll do the best I can, sir. As I understand it, there were three possible plans of attack suggested by Secretary Armstrong. General Wilkinson accepted the second plan and then changed... What do you think, John? Well, I've always thought, Mr. President, you may be young, but he's got a head and a heart. Uh, frankly, he made me feel better. <laughs> he certainly doesn't lack confidence. No, all we need is a few more Scots on land and a few more Perrys at sea. We'll see, Mr. Secretary. We'll see. <laughs> Colonel Scott, let us suppose you were given command of the Niagara area. What would be your first act? Mr. President, I have long seen and learned through bitter experience that an untrained or a half-trained army is no army at all. Our regulars are few, and more often than not, their officers are made by political appointment, and so even they can hardly be effective if led by men with no military experience. The militia are even in worse straits. Some of them are not even familiar with their own muskets. And their officers, for the most part, aren't fit to lead a mule train. And you would change these conditions in what manner? Just as von Steuben did at Valley Forge, sir. Mm -hmm. Before my command made one move against the British, I'd put it through the most rigorous training course I could devise. I'd teach them to drill, sir. How to deploy in battle. I'd teach them discipline and respect for their officers. In short, sir, I'd teach them how to be soldiers. And I'd start by training the officers first. And, Mr. President, if any silk pants popinjay objected, I'd personally fling him into Lake Erie in good riddance. <laughs> Which might have political repercussions. <laughs> Which I respectfully suggest, Mr. President, would not be as serious as a lost war. Yes, I must admit there are a few splashes I'd enjoy hearing myself. Colonel Scott will speak further of this tomorrow at 10. Certainly your ideas are sound and necessary. But... How much time would it take to train such an army? Give me two months, sir, and I'll do it. While Colonel Scott was expressing his opinions to President Madison in Washington, an action took place along the Niagara which brought about an extremely serious crisis. The American commander, Brigadier General George McClure, forced to retreat from his position at Fort George when threatened by a far superior British force, burned the town of Newark, turning 400 women and children out of their homes in the dead of winter. Even though the president disavowed McClure's action, retribution was swift and terrible. The British swept across the New York border, burning and pillaging, their Indian allies massacring all who stood in their path. All American resistance along the frontier of western New York came to an end in that dread winter of 1814. It was then that 27-year-old Colonel Scott was promoted to Brigadier General and sent to Buffalo to take charge of a new command to be made up of both regular and militia troops. Oh, oh! Who's in charge of this outpost? Sergeant Cole, sir. Where is he? He's in that shed down there, asleep. You the only other man at this outpost? No, sir, four others. Where are they? Uh, they're down there asleep too, sir. Why aren't you with them? Because I'm on guard, sir. What's your name? Private James O'Neill, sir. You're now Sergeant James O'Neill. Come along with me, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Where's your company headquarters? About a half mile down the road, sir. Who's in charge? Hey, Captain Forsythe. But he hasn't been in camp for the last week. Ensign Stark has been in command. What about your lieutenants? Uh, they don't seem to be around either, sir. Now you let me handle this. Sir. Whoa, whoa, whoa. 
All right, on your feet. All of you, come on, get up. Up! Wait, 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 what? Who the devil do you think you be? No fancy dan of an officer. You shut like... your face, Private Cole. Private? Private, is it? Sergeant, I am, and Sergeant, I'll stay until a better man can take those stripes from me. Come on, boys, let's teach big britches a lesson. You stay out of this, O'Neill! <laughs> Very pretty, sir. Now you two men take him back to camp, throw him in the guardhouse, then get back up here as fast as your legs will carry you. Yes, sir. Sergeant O'Neill, you're in charge of this outpost until relieved. Post your men as you see fit. If you have any further trouble, take whatever action suits you best. That I will, sir. That I will. Good day to you. Love me. Who was that? I don't know, but I'm awful glad to see him. Pick up that slug. All right, you two, follow me. Let me hear one peep out of you. <laughs> Gentlemen, I'd like your attention. Now, for those of you whom I'm unknown to, let me introduce myself. I'm Brigadier General Winfield Scott, your new commander. As for my officers, I haven't called you together here to hold a tea. In the two days I've been here, I've reached one definite conclusion. For the most part, this army is a slovenly disorganized mess, which reflects on you. I want silence! Now, I have plans to turn this body of troops into a well-trained fighting force. And to do so, I'll need your cooperation. I not only expect it, I demand it. Any of you who are not willing to work and sweat with me are at liberty to resign your commissions here and now. To have well-trained troops, we must have well-trained officers. And I personally am going to see that you get such training. I trust that you've all read the order I've issued on the training program. So now, if you've got anything to say, let's hear it once and for all. This uh, training program, General, how does it affect field officers? It affects all officers, Major, field or otherwise. And uh, who, may I ask, is going to conduct the training? I thought I made that clear, Major. I'll be the drill sergeant. Turned out en masse bright and early the next morning with the big 27-year-old brigadier to drill them, the officers of Fling Hill were formed into squads, issued muskets, and put through their paces unmercifully. Company! Right! Right! Squad, company, and battalion, Scott taught them to march in column and line, to wheel and deploy, to right. handle their weapons quickly right. and effectively. His guide was a tattered old book of French regulations right. issued by Napoleon, and the only such textbook in the entire American army. Company, left, right! But molding an army isn't all drill, a fact Scott knew only too well. He set up classes for instruction in military courtesy. He insisted upon a snappy salute from the lowest buck private to his second in command. His rigid maintenance of field hygiene and camp police paid off. The encampment at Fling Hill was kept spotlessly clean. Single-handed, Winfield Scott was building himself an army. At ease, gentlemen. Well, I've got some good news for you. Your training period is over. Tomorrow, you start on your men. It'll be ten hours a day, six days a week. Time is short. We have to work fast. When we take the field this time, I don't expect to go anywhere but forward. Day by day, the change takes place. Raw, clumsy recruits sweat and learn. Pride and self-respect and confidence are born and grow. Regiments find it's possible to maneuver in wooded country without getting lost. Whole brigades find they can deploy in any direction under any circumstance without getting tangled in each other's way. Winter gives way to spring, spring to early summer. June has come, and it's time to put the newly trained army to the test. Gentlemen, I regret this army must go into battle clothes and militia gray. I had hoped to lead it in regular army blue, 
The gray is all the quartermaster department can give us. However, gentlemen, gray or in rags, I shall lead you and be proud in that duty. You are listening to the proudly we hail production, The General Bills an Army. Our story will continue in just a moment after this important message. Young man, if you're interested in continuing your education, here is important news for you. The senior service of our armed forces, the United States Army, urgently needs qualified technicians to operate and maintain the many kinds of equipment that science has brought into being. Right now, men are being trained in such varied fields as radio, radar, meteorology, mechanics, electronics, photography, and many, many others. This training is given by the finest technical training schools in the world. It's an excellent opportunity for young men with intelligence and ambition. It can be the start of a great career for you. For full details, visit your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station. Do it today. And now your Army and your Air Force present the second act of the proudly we hail production, The General Bills an Army. The period, the War of 1812. Lying between Lake Ontario and Lake Erie is a broad tongue of Canadian territory separated from the United States by the fast-moving Niagara River. It was the plan of the American army to cross the river, take the British-held fort on the other side, push forward and expel the enemy from his key stronghold at Burlington. The troops would then move east along the northern rim of Lake Ontario and capture first York and then Kingston. Shortly after midnight on the morning of July 3rd, the first units of Major General Jacob Brown's army began its invasion, with Winfield Scott leading the 1st Brigade and its artillery on an attack of Fort Erie. Helmsman, a bit more to port. Try to keep those poles from splashing. How can you tell where we're heading in this muck, sir? I made a reconnaissance yesterday, George. I know, but you could see then. I smell what I can't see. Now keep your voice down. Steady as she goes, Helmsman. Good thing we're all linked together. Couldn't pick a worse night. Nonsense, George. Stop your belly aching. Couldn't pick a better night. Never expect us. Can't see any better than we. Easy now, men. Ah, look there. You can just make out the shore. You two men stand by your poles and bring her in. The rest of you, over the side with me. And quietly, they'll have a picket here about. Who goes? All right, men, chase them out! Well, there's one picket flush. They'll warn the fort. It'll good, it'll do. All right, start getting those rafts in here on the double. I want that fort before sunrise. Fort Erie, badly undermanned, surrendered quickly to Scott's superior force. By the 4th of July, the entire American army was across the river and ready to move northward against Major General Riel's command, which manned the entire British right wing. Early on the morning of the 4th, Scott and his brigade pushed off to lead the advance, driving back British observation parties. Confident in their superior ability, the British fell back coolly, if somewhat hurriedly. They knew once their main body of troops came up, a few volleys and the Americans would break and run, as had happened so often in the past. Let the beggars come on. When we all get here, we'll give them something to shout about. One brigade folly and they'll run like scared rabbits. Sergeant, deploy your men along that fence. Two rounds and then fall back. Lovely day, isn't it, Henry? Well, Lieutenant Watts, enjoying yourself? Oh, yes, sir. It's been a grand day. Sixteen miles we've chased them, George. Just across a million creeks, and at every one they thoughtfully removed the bridge planking. <laughs> You're lucky we didn't give them time to burn their bridges. Are we going to cross the Chippewa after them, General? Well, I don't let the smell of the chase idle your senses, George. 
Rial's dug in over there with the main body. We don't move against them until General Brown catches up. They're falling back across Streets Creek. Bring your men in. Yes, George, what is it? Well, I'm sorry to disturb you, General, but there's a Mrs. Street outside. She lives in the farmhouse just across the creek, and she'd like to speak to you. Well, show her in by all means. Come in, madam, come in. You must excuse the smallness of my tent. Sit there, won't you? Thank you, sir. Now, in what way may I serve you? There's, there's going to be a fight here about soon, isn't there? It's a likely probability, Mrs. Street, but just where, I couldn't say. My home is right across this creek. Could, could you see that no harm comes to it? It's all I've got. Mrs. Street, you have my word that your home will go untouched by any American troops. If you're able to get the same safeguard from the British, you can put your fears at rest. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. My pleasure, ma'am. If, if you'd like fresh vegetables and milk, I have plenty to sell. Fresh milk? It's an excellent idea. I'll detail a squad of men to take you home. George, see to it. I just thought of something else. If you and your staff would like to have breakfast at my place... Well, that's very kind of you, Mrs. Street, but we can't put you to so much trouble. It will be no trouble, sir, I promise you. And it'll be a good breakfast. <laughs> well, in that case, Mrs. Street, for my staff and myself, we accept gladly. <laughs> Well, Mrs. Street, you surely know the way to a man's heart. Oh, sir, if I'd had more time, I'd have served you gentlemen a real breakfast. Well, if I had any more to eat, I wouldn't be able to move. <laughs> God bless you, Lieutenant Watts. Oh, excuse me. Got to get a handkerchief. Hay fever. Some more coffee, General. Oh, uh, just one more cup, Mrs. Street. I must get... For the love of... General, it's a trap. Indians coming across the field. Come on, run for it. Gotta reach the bridge! Save your breath and run! On a well-filled stomach, no man feels like trying to break a track record. But when you're being chased by a mob of howling savages, your feelings are guided by a somewhat strong urge. Winfield Scott and his staff made the bridge in safety and worried about their digestion later. How are things with Porter, Lieutenant? He's driven their scouting parties out of the woods, sir. Good. General Brown was just here. Rial's recrossed the Chippewa. We're going to have a battle. Find Towson, tell him to get his artillery up here on the double. Yes, sir. Colonel! Call your men in. Follow me across the creek. And now the battle. It was joined on the plain between the Chippewa River and Streets Creek. In order for Scott to cross the creek, he had to march his men over a narrow bridge and then deploy them right and left to face the oncoming British columns. The maneuver was executed under heavy artillery fire, and it was here that the long weeks of drill and tactics paid off. Calmly, with Scott at its head, the brigade dressed its line and began to move forward. The British general, on first seeing the gray-clad ranks, remarked happily, Buffalo militia, they'll run at the first volley. Take this message to General Brown at once. The 25th is in the woods, covering my left flank. Towson and his battery are on my right. With Leavenworth and McNeil's battalions, I'm attacking. As the gray coats, whom the British general had mistaken for militia, moved steadily forward, he changed his tune in amazement. He was faced by troops as calm under fire as any he had ever seen. Not only that, the American artillery fire was reaping a terrible harvest amongst his own ranks. Who was the big dashing figure on horseback who rode at the head of his troops with a charmed life? Well, when it got down to cold iron, they'd break and run. Or uh, would they? Men! They say the Americans are good at long shot, but can't stand the cold iron. I call on you instantly to give a lie to that slander. Charge! Well, 
Well, George, you've lived through your first battle. Feel like another? Uh, we beat them, sir. Badly. Yes, but one battle doesn't win a war. We'll meet them again tomorrow. Or the next day. Or the next. It was a wonderful victory, sir. Yes, but not as you think, George. It isn't so much a victory because we won a battle. It's a victory because we've proved here today that American troops, when properly trained, are as good and better than the best. I'd like to add something to that, General. When properly trained and properly led. <laughs> well, you flatter me like that, and I'll have to make you a captain. General Brown wrote of the Battle of Chippewa, Brigadier General Scott is entitled to the highest praise our country can bestow. To him, more than any other man, I am indebted for the victory of the 5th of July. Even though the battle was a relatively small one, and Winfield Scott went on to win bigger and greater victories both on the field and in his life, it marked an essential milestone in American military history, for it proved the necessity and value of adequate training and organization. It also did much to encourage the formation and maintenance of a regular army that could be proud of itself. In 1815, in commemoration of the Battle of Chippewa, the War Department ordered that the uniform of the cadets at the Military Academy be thereafter of the gray cloth worn by the 1st Brigade on July the 5th, 1814. Proudly we hail Winfield Scott, soldier of his country. It shall not happen here. That is the unspoken prayer of every man in the United States Army. That is the unspoken reason for our growing military might. But the time has come to speak. The time has come to tell of that small phrase, those five words, it shall not happen here. Let us speak only to those young men of America who have not taken pause to think. Let's shout it in a voice that will reach into every city and village across the length and breadth of this great land. Young men, you are needed. You are needed to help preserve the peace. You are needed to serve in your United States Army to ensure for your loved ones that it shall not happen here. You are urged to visit your local United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station at your earliest opportunity and ask about the technical careers of the United States Army. The need is urgent. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this station. Proudly We Hail is produced by the Recruiting Publicity Center for the United States Army and United States Air Force Recruiting Service. This is Kenneth Banghart speaking and inviting you to tune in the same station next week for another interesting story on Proudly We Hail. <laughs>